Hello, I'm Konstantin Shamrai. I am 33 years old. I um, was born in Russia and I won the 2008 Sydney International Piano Competition. The unusual part was that I got so lucky and I won both first prize and people's choice prize, which was the first time in the Sydney competition's history. And uh, it's same up to nowadays. The winning such competition, of course, opened a lot of doors for me and uh, gave me certain freedom as well. Freedom of choice, uh, what I could do um, and which path I would take. There were co quite a bit of opportunities to play around the world and from them uh, the new contacts started. And Sydney competition definitely was a big, big uh, step up straight away. Well, after, straight after the competition, I stayed in Australia for two months. It was an, a very pleasant surprise for me and for my family as well. And I straight after gave 27 recitals within those um, one and a half, two months. Traveled all around the country and of course all the capitals and many, many regional places, in, especially in New South Wales and uh, Queensland. And it was, as I consider, it was one of the happiest period of my life. Um, being, especially traveling on those uh, turbo props, playing kangaroo jumps between those regional places, feeling a new life is starting and, and you feel somewhere far away when nobody, people I, I know haven't been to that many places. And what's immediately uh, you know, also struck me, I would say, was how warm the public was. Every single place I landed, uh, every single concert back then, there were many standing ovations. Sometimes I would play, after, I remember some concerts I played six encores. It's not such usual thing and uh, plus, in some places, uh, well, I would say Cairns or uh, maybe some of Mackay, they don't have too many classical um, re piano recitals and people really appreciate it. They wanted to hear and they wanted to hear as much as possible. So the whole experience was absolutely fantastic. And then next year I did a big tour with the Australian String Quartet. Um, we did all the capitals also very sophisticated audiences. And then we went on, uh, on South Australian regional tour and went to Port Lincoln, Wyala, all those little places. Sometimes different pianos, <laughs> not always very good pianos, but it was a lot of happiness. It was first time when, when I realized that Australian people really can enjoy life and uh, they know how to be happy, how to feel happy. After the competition, I decided I also needed to continue my studies um, and get you know, highest degree possible and uh, I wanted new experiences, I wanted to play for more people in terms of having more professors, more ears. So I entered the Gnesin Academy so-called Aspirantur, so it's postgraduate studies and a couple of years later I went to Germany, the city of Freiburg because I found a very, 
very good professor, an excellent musician. What happened then, I realized that whole bureaucratic uh, systems, some degrees don't, sort of, they, they don't match with other degrees in the whole system. So I decided I needed to do masters as well and PhD. So, and the best place in Australia, by, by that time I was a permanent resident in Australia, so best place appeared to be Adelaide. And I, I'm absolutely positive about this. The best place for a performer to do PhD. Because in Adelaide, you know, PhD is based on performing. So you perform much more and you record much more music and then you write uh, less. So that's where the balance is shifted to. And I think it's perfect. It's just ideal for the performers. Uh, many people from Sydney, um, Catherine Selby and, and uh, others, all, all the famous people come and do PhD in Adelaide. So I did masters, uh, I finished masters in one year instead of two years and then did PhD. And uh, I don't want to sound dis dis uh, dis sort of not modest, but uh, I also got this medal for research uh, for, for, for masters. В четырех частях солист Константин Шамрай, дирижер Владимир Спиваков. My father was a very, very prominent pianist, very talented, and uh, he used to play at home. My mom also uh, played piano, so they were both professional pianists, and my brother therefore started learning piano. And I remember first time, it, at least it's what I first remember, is my father sitting at the piano and playing the first prelude from Voltaire de Clavier. C major. Um, it was something completely overwhelming for me. I probably was four. I said, could you please play it again? So he played it again and I said, could you please play it again? And he said, no, I'm not playing it again. But um, he played something else. I think probably Rachmaninoff's Lilacs uh, transcription. That was probably what drew me to music. My childhood dream was to become a train driver and, and, and drive that suburban train. And then I also fell in love with, it, with music. And then it altered a bit, and I decided that I wanted to be a, a train driver who gives recitals. So, <laughs> my, my back then idea was, you drive a train, you stop, you go play concert, <laughs> and then you drive it somewhere again. So that's how it all started. And also, um, in Soviet Union it was absolutely normal, many people go to kindergarten. I was not an, not an exception and I could not stand kindergarten because I used to be a very quiet boy, unlike now, uh, and all that noise just made me maybe very, very unhappy. And once I came home and I said to my mom, I'm not going back ever. And she said, well, but you are too young to stay home on your own then you have to come with me to work. And she worked in the music school. I said, oh yeah, I will do that, please. So, and I went with, started going with her to music school, to her work. And if I was there anyway, so that's how I started music lessons. My first ever music lesson was with my dad as well. I remember it quite well. He was a you know, proper pianist, accomplished pianist and started showing me some things. Uh, he probably was not necessarily a teacher for young kids. 
uh, and you know you, you you need to first have a house, all that stuff, uh, curled fingers. And he said, ah, oh, maybe maybe you don't need it all, you know, just flatten your fingers, you know, when you get as you get more and more and more professional, you not necessarily always bend your fingers and, and stuff like this. But first, you have to go through proper schooling to be able to do it. So he he tried to do some to make me do some some things which I had no idea about and couldn't understand what he wanted from me. After that, he said to my mom, "I said, I think with this boy we we have no hope." And mom said, "You know what? Let let let's have another go, and I'll take him to an old lady." <laughs> she took me to this old babushka, which we call it in Russia. And babushka, her whole life was teaching kids, and she knew exactly, first of all, what to do. I mean, I mean technically, and then what to do. Second of all, she knew mentality of kids, and she knew how to make kids interested. Uh, so that was love from the first sight, and we started lessons. Two hours we were sitting, she was teaching me, and I never got tired. That's, that's how my first steps were. Public performance is a unique and in many aspects unexplainable experience. Never you can be sure what's going to happen. Sometimes you go on stage feeling that you are in a good shape and as soon as you, you, you start the first note suddenly you understand that out of, out of blue everything is not going the pattern you imagine and the, uh, not not going as well as you might have felt before and then what is most important is to be able to change on the spot uh, because things happen we are all humans uh, sometimes we even can forget text um, a little detail but it can happen and it did happen to me and uh, of course, it's not the most probably pleasant thing, but it did happen to great artists too, to the greatest of greatest. And that makes me feel a bit better that oh, at least it, I'm not <laughs> alone. What is most important is how do you deal with the situation, how you deal with the crisis if it happens on stage. There is no exact way how to, I guess it's a mix of you experience your intuition a lot and maybe some luck sometimes as well. In, in many ways I found that if something doesn't go right from the start, you concentrate much more and you, you, know, you become a bit more unhappy, which in the end might, might produce better result. So it's always better to have concert going sort of crescendo way rather than giving everything in the beginning and then diminishing by the end and making everybody tired uh, and thinking oh, when is he going to finish and sometimes you feel much better and in, you start playing and you have nice surprises as well and for instance suddenly you realize that piano can do much more than you expected at the rehearsal which I think is part of it is that uh, at the concert all senses are very sharp and open so sometimes you can have m many more abilities that, than, than even in practice room although I believe that you have to practice always um, towards the concert so feeling as if you were playing at the concert and giving everything into practice and then on stage you might have something else coming. That's the best, very rarely achieved for me, part when 
on stage and I suddenly feel, yeah, I have this, 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 these patterns and a bit of a you know, planning, let's say, but on stage something else is born exactly at the moment. It's new, but at the same time it's organic. I always try to be honest with the music. You can never achieve uh, something, you know, at Mount Everest because there's no such thing as a last point. You always, once you achieve something else, you see much higher and then another one, there is another one which is even higher. So if you continue going towards those unachievable goals, then probably you develop. Um, that's what I try to do. That's what my goal. and. If I ever f start feeling happy with myself, I know for the fact it, it will mean I'm going downhill. Sometimes it, it does work for, for, at least for me and for music, when you get so unhappy with yourself. and uh, it's, it's not depression, it's different. You just get really edgy, edgy and mm, almost angry exactly unhappy with you, with yourself, with other people, which means that you get out of your comfort zone and it's good. You get out of your comfort zone, you might do something unusual, but you start going towards, uh, again, you're going up. So my most biggest fear is to get comfortable and I never want to feel comfortable with myself. I remember one moment uh, perfectly, still. Um, it happened during the Sydney competition. Uh, at the final stages of it, when I was rehearsing with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. So we, we were rehearsing Prokofiev's second concerto. And I somehow felt that things were not going right, in the right direction some life was missing. Maybe it was also me trying to push too hard and you know sometimes this happens. You, you need to you need to find a way how to uh, get together. And then at some point I got very edgy and I said to the conductor, to the conductor, could you please ask them to play louder here but not long, just with energy. And he said to me it was Kirill Karabets conducting. He said, you talk to them. So I stood up and he said, an artist wants to, to say something. And I still remember what I said. I said, at the end of the cadenza, when you come in, you have to smash me. Understand? Just smash me. But smash with energy. Don't just drag. You come and I will try to fight you back. And then we will have some um, friction of what we need exactly. You have to try and smash me. They got so happy. I remember the trombone section, they, they laughed and uh, they said, okay, we will. Because usually they ask to play less and less. And you know what happened in, in the competition they did. I always find uh, it, it's important to 
to communicate with the orchestra. But uh, not always conductors like it because some of them feel that you're challenging them, maybe. If I was a conductor, I probably would never feel that way. Um, I remember another story. It was a Klavier Ruhr festival in Germany. I was playing there and they decided that it, it was supposed to be recorded. So, and they later published a CD of the concert. I played, uh, among others, I played Carnaval by Schumann. There's uh, some famous uh, section called Paganini, where you, you, the jumps and everything. And they said to me, maybe we should pre-record a bit of your rehearsal, so in case something goes wrong with the concert, uh, we can always adjust and use something. I said, okay, good idea. At the concert, I remember it was a lot of uh, adrenaline happening to me. I remember playing really fast, still remember that. And some things were, yeah, that, that particular Paganini, I remember not playing it too clean and, and, and everything. Then later, maybe half a year later, I got this recording from the concert. And I thought, oh, that is so boring. And then I realized that it was, they, they, they took everything which was clean. So they took Paganini from uh, the rehearsal when I was not playing full power. And uh, yes, it, it was much more, you know, brushed as we call it in Russian, hair brushed, yeah? which lost some effect to me. I was supposed to play with Mariinsky Orchestra in St. Petersburg. Um, it was a year and a half ago. Janacik, Capriccio for the left hand and the wind ensemble. Suddenly I got a phone call and said, Constantine, could you come one day early, please? Because the conductor is a bit concerned about uh, the whole, you know, whole thing. He, he wants to have an extra rehearsal, just to, to be sure. I thought, it's a great idea. I will. And the conductor, Misha Damev, uh, said to me, oh, thanks so much. Let's start the rehearsal. So it's wind ensemble and the piece has never been played uh, by Mariinsky Theatre uh, back then. The first thing we start, and then suddenly the tuba player, the tuba player says, oh, excuse me, <laughs> it's all in treble clef, I can't play, <laughs> I can't play it. So it appeared to be not the big tuba, but a tuba, either Wagner tuba or something else. And Misha turned to me and he said, do you understand how right I was imagining it happening on the general rehearsal or something? So the next day everything was fixed, of course. But uh, we, we all laughed. When I uh, first flew to Australia, it was by London and we were flying Qantas from London to Sydney. The very first thing um, was we came to London and I said, Qantas engineers are all on strike in Sydney, so the plane didn't come. The, the, the 24 hour strike, you go tomorrow. Here's your visa for 24 hours in London because as a Russian citizen, I need a visa. So they gave hotel, visa, go. And I said, oh, good airlines, you know. 
So, but I got to, 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 to walk in London. We all were quite happy about that. Then we came to Sydney 48 hours later. And because of that, the whole competition schedule had to, had to be changed. So those who came first, who were not on strike, who didn't come with Qantas that, that time, had to play first. And then, then, after winning the competition, when I was told that I was going to do 27 results, I said, how am I going to go everywhere? By train? And I said, no, you, you're going to fly everywhere. Said, everywhere to fly, so much. <laughs> yeah, why not? And then I was flying these turboprops and big ones as well. So I fell in love with Qantas because I immediately felt it's a different, again, mentality of how people take flights here. It's much more casual, much more relaxed, welcoming. Well, memories from childhood, I would always, it would be, you know, a lot of control, 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 and then you go on the plane and you, you sit there and wait until it's finally over. That's how I first fell in love with flying. And then, what happened, you, you probably all know the story of QF32, which happened in 2010. So the pilot, Richard, uh, wrote a book. I read this book and I thought, why not? I, I will message him. I found him on Facebook. Just sent him a message of appreciation because there were some points in the book which I loved. Um, I sent him a message. He replied immediately and he said oh come and have coffee with me with us or whatever next time you're in sydney and next time i was in sydney i did message him although my friend said oh you're you're this weirdo you're stalking a Qantas pilot famous guy i said well who cares i don't care so and we had dinner and we ever since uh, we have we become good friends also, when I was traveling, another thing, when I was doing those travels, 27 results, I stopped in Armidale and played there. And um, the back then, directors of Considerance, husband appeared to be a Qantas 747 pilot. And so, and I stayed at their place, talked a lot. Then I uh, met another person who was also flying for, for Qantas and then retired and built a concert uh, house in his property, Lucas Parklands. Um, I also played there, stayed there, and we talked. We also became very good friends, and uh, you know, Lucas always wants, to, Ian always wants to talk about music. I always want to talk about flying and ask him questions. And so we have this core for you. He said, two last questions about flying, that's it. And I said, oh, then two last questions about music. And that's it.